Hi, I'm Ben Taylor. Um, we'll start in a minute, but if I could get a show of hands, how many people here are primarily interested in the healthcare angle? Can you show me your hand? And how many are more interested in the supply chain angle? Can you show your hands? So pretty balanced. And uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, and then in terms of, this has been tr logged in as a business track talk. How many people here thought they were going to a business track talk? And how many people thought they were going to a technology talk? OK. So it's a mixed bag. I think we've got 40 minutes. I'm going to move pretty quickly, but you should jump in, raise your hand, and engage. We'll try to cover all four of those topics. Um, the presentation is laid out with healthcare on the front end in terms of the problem space and um, supply chain and technology on the back end in terms of the solution space. Um, if I lose you a little bit on the front end with all the acronyms, please don't hesitate to jump in. Um, but I think that this is a very interesting, useful test case for Hyperledger Fabric and for the Hyperledger community. And let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the pharmaceutical supply chain is an underperforming old style paper-based supply chain. And there was a law passed about 10 years ago to try to pull it kicking and screaming into a more modern era. And initially, people thought that they might do that with advanced new technology like email. Um, and that has turned out not to really meet their needs. And so the FDA came to the public about a year ago and asked for newer approaches. And they asked for um, people to come forward. And um, not surprisingly, Hyperledger community members were leaders in that. And so of the 18 or so projects that came forward as pilots, over half of them were blockchain-based pilots, and about a quarter of them were from members of the Hyperledger community. We teamed with UCLA, uh, who is also a Hyperledger member, to try to tackle this, and we partnered with Biogen, a large pharmaceutical company, to try to look at this. And let's delve into exactly what the challenge is. So as we said, the FDA called for pilots, and what they wanted us to do was to try to understand to what extent counterfeits, illegitimate drugs, expired drugs were continuing their way through the system all the way to the patient, where they might be introduced, and how you might get a sense for what's going on. There have other issues in the supply chain that were outside the scope of this study that included drug recall, drug shortages, and a variety of other things. To put it in perspective, how many of you are treated within the US healthcare system? You look surprisingly good. 17% um, of the drugs that you pick up at your pharmacy are incorrectly dispensed. You're getting the wrong drug. You're getting expired drug. You're getting someone else's drug. We're getting drug from another country that might not even be approved for use in the US. Um, but as I said, we do look pretty good as a country, but you can see that recent mortality statistics say that we could do a little better, and certainly for our spending dollar. So what did we do? We delivered for the last mile, that's where we focused, which is from the hospital to the patient. We delivered a life-saving medication directly to the patients that need them. It was real patients, real doctors, real everything on a real blockchain. And we did this with an iOS client on an iPhone running on our framework on top of the Hyperledger fabric. We'll delve into this further as we get into it. So again, it's surprising that we don't talk about this. There's certain topics I wanted to surface today 
that don't get talked about very much in our community. And it's a mystery to me why we're going to sit through another presentation on zero knowledge proofs when we can actually talk about real business problems. So right now, everybody has their own relational database. And there's really no way to keep people from spoofing each other. They're man in the middle attacks. And that's why some people this last year went to pick up a bottle of OxyContin and got a bottle of Advil instead. Someone had swapped it out on them and tricked them. And it never was caught. And this sort of stuff goes on all the time. So this is the law. DSCSA is called Drug Supply Chain Security Act. It's a new federal law. And the big phrase here, interoperable system. So interoperable system, many of us in this room would read that as blockchain-based system. It doesn't have to be. But clearly, that old Death Star model of my relational database, your relational database, and a fax machine between them is not going to work because you have to go through your nine hops from UCLA all the way back to Biogen in 24 hours. And people aren't picking up their emails, that sort of thing. So we need a real-time system. And so we focused on building a system that we felt could deliver something in the order of a two to 300 millisecond response time. The system itself, the blockchain we have running on a 50 millisecond latency. And so when we were at um, the FDA last month, they, they, they've now defined 50 milliseconds as real, real time. So we've got three years to get it to interoperate. We're supposed to be working today, but interoperation is three years. So where did we focus as we talked about? This is obviously UCLA's forte from the technician who's getting the drug into the pharmacy, to the cart, to the practitioner, through to the patient. And I want to scope it out for you. Have any of you ever been to a pharmacy in a large medical center? OK, so we've got a couple of you might guess. You already know the answer to this. So to scope it out for the rest of you, UCLA has 500 pharmacists. The main pharmacy is the size of a Costco. And outside is a whole fleet of trucks waiting to drop refrigerated gear. And so under DSCSA, they're going to have to scan the barcode on every one of these deliveries coming in and every dose. And that's what it looks like. So this is Spinraza. This is the star of our show. Spinraza is not shown life size here. It's about this big. And it's $125,000 a dose. UCLA's drugs of that size are now coming in. Zolgensma, $2.4 million a dose. So clearly, all of a sudden, they're very focused on making sure they know where this drug is at all times. OK, so let's talk about this. This is our terrific partner team at UCLA, chief pharmacy officer, purchasing manager, and Dr. Shea, who personally treats all the patients. All right, you guys are going to raise your hand if you can't hear the video. In three years, under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, the U.S. pharmaceutical supply chain will be brought together by an electronic interoperable system to identify and trace prescription drugs as they are distributed throughout the country. Selected by the FDA for the DSCSA pilot project program, UCLA Health and Ledger Domain join forces to create Bruin Chain, a blockchain-based solution designed to track and trace changes in drug custody, perform mandated DSCSA checks, and interoperate with trading partners. Bruin Chain was tested with real data in a real-world setting at one of the busiest hospitals in the United States. From the receiving bay to patient administration, caregivers scan the drug's unique 2D barcode using the Bruin Chain mobile app. This makes it possible to track the drug through the pharmacy at the stockroom level with every transaction logged on the blockchain. During its journey, the drug passes a series of checks until it's administered to the patient. Bruin Chain is also designed for exception handling. Under DSCSA and GS1 requirements, each barcode contains important information about the drug. When caregivers scan the barcode, this information is automatically extracted. New barcodes are routed to a trading partner for verification, and the drug is held back from being administered. At any time, the prescriber can view the progress of the drug through the pharmacy into the clinic. The trading partner can either verify the drug 
or indicate that there is a problem, such as a potential counterfeit. Trading partners can be provided with a real-time data stream on where their drug is and when that unit has been dispensed and even administered. If a drug is found to be suspect at any point, it is stickered and physically quarantined. If human review reveals a high risk of illegitimacy, RuneChain provides all the data needed to notify the FDA and trading partners. If the drug is verified as authentic, the prescriber gets a green light and can now administer with confidence. Beneath the surface, Bruin Chain passes messages and tracks changes in custody between six different roles. Here's a quick look at the system architecture, including the DocuSeal framework and Oraculous notification service. By combining blockchain with commercial off-the-shelf technology, Bruin Chain makes it possible to track and verify drugs in a busy hospital or neighborhood pharmacy. With Bruin Chain, doctors and pharmacists have a powerful new tool helping them in their mission to get the right drugs to the people who need them. Okay, so one of the things I want to talk about is just to go back over what you just saw and think about some of the things that Hyperledger Fabric does out of the box. It's really, we've been members here for four years. We've been building since the 06 release. We're not on 2.0 yet. This is all available to you in 1.4. But it's a really terrific and powerful workflow engine. And that's really where the value is. This idea that, you know, it seals the data better or whatever, that's really good stuff. But in real life, if you're trying to build a terrific application, the excitement is really in the flows. And what I want to drag your attention to here is in the supply chain world, you've got the solid arrows where you're working with the physical flow, and then you've got those lighter brown arrows where you've got a data flow. And all of this stuff is inside of our system. You really have to work to get your user stories right. You have to get your privileges right. You have to get your roles right. All this stuff was all inside the iPhone. Everybody got a different look. So only the doctor can administer the drug. Only the pharmacist can dispense the drug, right? Everybody knows that. But again, all of this stuff is enforced and enhanced with the Hyperledger framework. It's really terrific for that. And so we had six different actors with multiple message formats. And remember what you're looking at here. This is only the happy path, right? So we've got to cover all of the sad paths as well. Again, when you're thinking about Bitcoin land and what you're reading about in the crypto world, everything's the happy path, unless you're on this hard fork. Everything's the happy path because Everything's existing in the digital world. But when you pull in the real world, you can have these sad path things crop up very quickly, and you've got to be able to manage this process with your workflow. How do you do that? And you've also got to manage the workflow in the real world. I was showing this to my friend from IBM earlier. You saw the flash, but these quarantine stickers we had to have made up. Why is that? Because once our blockchain system showed them that they had drugs they needed to quarantine, they had to figure out what to do with them. For the last hundred years in the ph pharmacy business, if the pill bottle came in, it was good to go. They've never thought about the idea of having it verified. And what do you do then? Well, you've got to have a plan. So what did we learn for the... FDA would reveal the barcode scanning with an iPhone was 100% effective with commercial off the shelf technology. That Hyperledger fabric based system was able to track everything at UCLA to the refrigerator level. This is a refrigerated product. We were able to tell them which refrigerator it was in anywhere on campus. It tracked the expiration dates, verified the barcodes with the manufacturer, confirmed that a human had inspected it to see it was good. And in fact, our stakeholders even wanted more tracking. So they went from basically having nothing. In the course of the week on their Spinraza, the typical drug was looked at inside the app by UCLA colleague 100 times. That's how closely they're monitoring this stuff. Dr. Shea would rather look at the inventory on his iPhone and then look in the refrigerator because the iPhone will tell him with Hyperledger, was this already verified by Biogen? Is the expiration date good? 
Is it good drug? Is it ready to go? All that information is right at his fingertips. Now, people talk about blockchain, why it's important, blah, blah, blah. Let's come back to what it's doing in supply chain. What it's really doing is when you federate relational databases, all you're doing is lumping together a bunch of things that don't agree. With the blockchain, you're removing the double counts and you're filtering out the bad transactions at the go. That's what you're really doing. And then you're driving the whole supply chain into a real-time collaboration and you're enforcing ground truth, okay? And then what we do is we robotically initiate private escalating notifications. And of course, that sets the stage for machine learning, other features to operate. And why do you do that? Because you're able to know that you got a single version of the truth. So again, explicitly defined, no wasted computation. All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about how did we build it? What, how do you go about doing these things? There's a lot of talk today about governance. We feel very good about it, but you have to make sure you're making it work. So in terms of Hyperledger Fabric, we use the components in orange out of the box. Plain vanilla, 1.x, will eventually migrate to 2.0, but I don't think that a newbie has to worry about migrating to 2.0 for another two years. The 1.x, despite some of the things that you've heard, is a highly performant system, works well. We find it to be very fast and very reliable. And one of the ways that we get there, which is a, perhaps a bigger investment than a lot of you'd want to make, is we go to 100% Golang across the system so we can get a multi-threaded experience that goes a little faster. Um, what I don't mention here is off-world credentials. Again, that's another thing that people will probably start making more use of in Hyperledger Fabric. Today, most of us are logging directly into the system. This one did that for the most part. But of course, you can use tokens and other approaches to use off-world credentials, which I think is going to be important. So again, Hyperledger is a great starting point. We added four additional components. We orchestrate and set up all of our networks with a product that we call FDOT. Then we have an app server that runs it. And the big thing that we add that basically gives us what I would call a layer two functionality is DocuSeal. It's our reusable framework for secure storage offline. And then we use Oraculous to do our Oracle work to check things off the chain. And the, as I said, the key thing there is once you get the data dumped onto private collections, which again we use in this instantiation, we use the private collections off the shelf. Hyperledger, it was very good service. Doesn't always provide the biggest data store. You can move to something else if you need that. But for this application, it was fine. And then um, you've got a very fast, very performant system. So as I said, that's what we added then. All this stuff, which sets up the supply chain for you, gets everything going. And then. We then add the app-specific stuff with advanced workflows, multiple roles, all the exception handling, and then we clocked it out at 50 milliseconds. So that's how we ran it. Um, and so again, it's a trade-off that everybody has to think about. We talked about this upstairs earlier. So we're probably, if I remember correctly, we're using 450,000 lines of Hyperledger fabric right out of the box. It's a very powerful, very performant system. You can do great stuff with it. But if you're going to do something with a lot of roles, supply chain, real world validation, exception handling, that's probably another 250,000 lines of code. And this is a big team effort. So this is not kid stuff. You can do the pilot. But if you want to write an iPhone app in Swift, have some designer build you something that have, doctor will actually use, which is hard, get everything to work on the inside, set it all up. I'm thinking it's probably seven, eight, nine person team to crank something out like that. 
not because it's necessarily that huge, but it's a wide range of skills. And I think that in the community, we're not always super forthcoming about this stuff. This idea that an individual hacker could just crank something out like this, not necessarily real life. And so the trick when you're getting into this is to think about what do you want to tackle? How are you going to team up with other people to get the skills that you need? In our case, we're more focused on the back end and we really have to work hard to find the right people to help us on the swift side that can come in and help us get the right artwork going that Biogen and UCL are going to be happy with. To put it in perspective, and everybody knows this stuff, but UCLA has a 99-page style guide for everything they want at UCLA. UCLA Health has a 40-page style guide. Biogen has a 99-page style guide. Making all this stuff work together not so trivial. So again, summary, wrote ahead for us. Hyperledger has a flexible modular design. We pick and choose what we need. It's got the backing of great industry players, a very healthy developer community, terrific documentation. And then the trick, as we talked about, is it's really hard to get an end-to-end -end understanding of what you need to get done build all that stuff and get it all working together. There's a lot to it. Um, and again, there seems to be still some issues around governance and orchestration. And why is that? It's very hard. We've worked in a lot of consortium situations. It's very hard to get. Uh, we had 21 Fortune 500 companies in one of our um, consortia. We couldn't get them to sign a two-page NDA. So. It's not really a hyperledger thing. It's a community thing. It takes a lot of oomph to make these things work. And something like a highly regulated industry you might shy away from normally, it can be helpful. So that's the kind of storyline. Um, that's what I came prepared to talk about today. But we've got plenty of time to take your questions. Just yell. Sure. So those are two great questions. If you saw in the video, we had that little game board. And we actually have a full-size table version of that. And what we did is we built a game board without arrows first. And we brought it into UCLA. And they pushed the boxes around the game board and agreed that that was how they did it. And then we added the arrows. And then we sent the game board to our developers. And they coded for that. And we tried it out. And we had to make a few adjustments. But that's exactly how they typically do it. So it comes into UCLA's receiving dock. It then gets moved to the intravenous pharmacy. And then it either goes to the Boyer Pharmacy for outpatient, or it goes to the OR. And then it goes to the clinic. So, And that's just one set. Um, but it is tricky to map these things out. And I don't know if anybody knew on day one how all of the drug comes in. It turns out that a lot of it comes in through other avenues because of Medicare and other rules that they have to follow. Um, on the um, interaction with Biogen, um, their company is a US company legally, um, but they run their serialization operation out of Switzerland. So we decided that we didn't really feel great about making them members of the blockchain instance. And so uh, our team developed a completely new and proprietary approach to build an oracle into our system to get that information. And uh, I think it was a terrific thing. I think it has more applicability. But again, I wouldn't want to say, and this is where I want to be really careful, um, just because this worked for us, we wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everybody else. I'm not sure that everything that we've done is that generalizable. And I'm not sure it's worth the effort. So for us, we've rewritten a lot of code in Golang and a couple of the other shops that we know. There's a Russian group that's done the same thing. We compare notes with them. 
But if you don't need that level of performance, there's more stuff off the shelf you can use that has more of a Java-ish flavor to it, right? So you got to decide kind of what's right for you. But yeah, that's how we ended up solving that one. And it'll be interesting to see on the next iteration how we'll tackle it. We believe that more people will be invited to enjoy, enjoy the blockchain experience over time in these communities. Early on, I'm not so sure how why we, widely we run roll it out. You know in your heart that there's a lot of people out there that believe everybody should be on every blockchain, but that's a really dead on arrival concept with most of our stakeholders. I'm good with it, but um, it's not a popular thing in the Fortune 500. We went from the manufacturer to the hospital and skipped the specialty pharma in this case. Um, so at this point, um, the specialty pharma is not at the um, serial number level, they at the lot level. So there really is nothing to check with them. We had to go directly to the manufacturer to get a serialized outcome. Um, and it was very nice of them to give us that level of attention. To get everybody to cooperate, even at UCLA, was already a lot of work. Um, I think UCLA is staring at maybe a $5 million a year bill to sort of do the DSCSA, so they wanted to have a voice. And they're obviously very sophisticated, very blockchain savvy group. And so that was great to get them involved. Um, but clearly going forward, it's some combination of regulatory focus and what people can learn. The, the, big, the two big learnings in that regard, I mentioned one, was that UCLA was very surprised to learn that they did look at these vials 100 times a week. Um, Biogen was surprised at how much they wanted the data once they got used to getting it. So initially, we only sent them sort of the failed data, but they click, quickly realized that they wanted to see all the data, which was nice. You know, it says that transparency is a thing that people would like, and real time is what they would like. From an enterprise standpoint, yes. Yes. So, I mean, inside of UCLA, there's a whole bunch of different people, but they all roll up to UCLA. Same thing with Biogen. We're interacting with a lot of people at Biogen, but it's just one company, obviously. And so, to your point, you know, next, we, our, our next goal is to blow it out to all 200,000 SKUs and model it for all 73,000 pharmacies and to show people how the whole product would scale. Yes. Yeah, there were 19 pilots, and I think 15 of the pilots were going to set out to prove that the drug in Pfizer's warehouse belonged to Pfizer. We didn't find that to be a very interesting thing to solve. So, yes, I mean, there's everybody has to do all of this stuff, but making sure that Pfizer's warehouse has Pfizer product in it is not that interesting uh, for us. You know, figuring out, so UCLA supports 800 clinical studies. They have the UC system, which works together, is a billion dollars in annual drug buy. Um, and it's coming in from all sorts of places. You'd be amazed at what comes in there. So for us, that was really the ultimate challenge, is the last mile. You know, if you have a thermodynamics background, you know which way entropy goes. And so, you know, the last mile is really where you're running into, you know, all of the entropic errors and problems that you would expect. That's where we thought the, the real value was. Um, but you're absolutely right. Eventually, both of you, I think, are making the same point. You want to encompass the entire supply chain. 
I think that there's some interest on the part of players like IBM and others to go all the way back to the APIs, right? I am sure I shouldn't use this jargon, but to the um, ingredients, right, back in China or wherever. People are thinking about that with coronavirus, like where's my drug coming from? Um, and so you want to sweep all the way through. Then, as I said, you've got 200,000 SKUs to track. You've got 73,000 uh, pharmacies. So there's a lot to do. And I wouldn't minimize anybody's effort, but that's what we decided to tackle. Um, we thought it was the most interesting. And I think that the FDA's goal now is to try to figure out, you know, what's coming. Our hope is that they'll realize that a lot of the winning projects we're on Hyperledger, which I think would be a huge win for our community. That would be one of our hopes. Uh, and our second hope would be that they would recognize that it's not really blockchain versus relational, it's blockchain versus email. You know, that's what we're really tackling here. And so people are always saying to me, Ben, couldn't you solve this with a relational database? And I say, you mean a Roach Motel? And it's like, no, and it's, like it's not really the same thing. With a blockchain system, you really have a high level of notifications and real-time management that's really clean with that single version of the truth that enables you to really deliver something nice. And with relational, you've got somebody digging through the database and you've got an email back when they're good and ready. And they don't know if it agrees with another database. So it's a, a very different set of challenges, I think. Any more questions? So that's a great question. Um, the two-dimensional barcode has been endorsed and let's maybe use the term promulgated by a global body called GS1. Um, so at this point, I would say that of maybe 185 countries, I believe they're up to about 146 countries. Um, so I mean, I think it's looking like it's going to win. Um, the US FDA is guiding a soft endorsement towards GS1. Um, so I think everybody's headed in that direction. And then in terms of the actual issue, I'm going to parse your question two ways. So every saleable drug package at this point should have a 2D barcode and it should in all likelihood be GS1 compliant. And that's what we saw. US, Europe, India, keep going. Yeah, it's, India is ahead of us. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you how, there's, I've heard things, but I, mean, I don't know if they're all the way to bright in terms of being able to do it, but India is a couple years ahead of us. Europe is probably a year ahead of us. Um, so there is an issue around this definition of saleable unit though. And it's no big deal for UCLA, they don't really care. So some of the things come in with barcodes, I mean, they're units of, like, they look to us like cases of 24. But, you know, if you're UCLA, you buy the cases. But for a smaller pharmacy, it's a little bit tricky. You wonder if they're breaking bulk earlier, and when it arrives there, maybe they're not getting a barcode cleanly. So somebody barcoded it at some point, but then it gets unwrapped at some point, and you lose it. And even at UCLA, there's an issue, there's a group called JCO that's the hospital group that decides how you're supposed to do stuff and USP. And best practice for UCLA would be to unwrap certain packages and throw away the outer packaging. And you've lost the barcode. And then you need it later, right? So we've been working closely with USP, we've been working closely with these other groups to try to help understand how this is all going to play out. But I think this is the process that we're in. We're definitely, there's still, to your point, a lot of corner cases to work through in the real world so that we can model them in the blockchain world. Uh, there's still some tricks there for sure. One more question. How many transactions can you measure? What's the benchmark? So the benchmark, ready for this? You're sitting down. Benchmark for that week with the FDA was five units. And we, Handily exceeded it. Um, the doctor informed us he's very dedicated. UCLA is a group incredibly dedicated. These kids are all dying of a horrible disease. 
and he wanted them to have a good Christmas, so he brought in everyone ahead of the Christmas break to get their dose. So we had a 12-dose week um, and very much exceeded. Um, and that's why I said we had to go back now and do some scalability testing uh, to show how it really works in real life. Um, but we, we feel actually quite confident about the scalability of the product. Um, but we need to back that up with actions now. So that's a great question. Um, I don't believe that that meta question has been settled for the long term, right? So uh, in fact, I was talking to the IBM guys earlier about you know, how they thought this might unfold. And you know, it's anyone's guess. Supposedly, the US government's not going to own the network. It's going to be an industry-supported network, whatever that means. Um, and I haven't seen any hard data. I'm originally from the securities industry, and we had a lot of rules, five-year rule, seven-year rule, custody rule, blah, blah, blah. It was all kind of laid out. Here, it's not as clear to me how that's going to work out over time. Uh, but I do think it'll be, I think the stuff's coming. I mean, it's going to come a lot faster than you think. Um, but for UCLA, uh, it's more about Today, you know, these kids are dying. They're keeping everything on a sheet and running around. And we came in the first day. They'd lost three doses, $400,000 down the tubes. And you know, they're running around trying to figure out where they are because their refrigerator had broken overnight uh, and they had to get moved. Um, so those are the kinds of things where, you know, it's, uh, it's tricky today to, to manage a pharmacy of that size. Um, and everything's done today, as you can imagine, not even at the lot level, just, you know, rough inventory. So this will really be terrific for them, be terrific for the patients. That's where the value is immediately. But yes, auditability, all these issues, I think, are going to be critical over time. Any more questions? I think we're out of time. I'm happy to address any other questions offline. Thanks very much.